On a chilly fall night in October of 1990, Kelly Sims headed out for a night on the town alongside her boyfriend. Together, the couple arrived at Tim's Tavern, a local bar in Kelso, Washington, where they were set to participate in a darts tournament. At some point, a heated discussion broke into an argument and the couple went their separate ways, her boyfriend heading home while Kelly made her way towards another bar. There, she ran into friends, had some drinks, and tried to salvage her night out. The foursome left together heading north to drop off one of the group before turning around and heading back towards Kelso. According to the driver, as he made his way through town, Kelly requested that he drop her near the Rendezvous Tavern. She wasn't ready to go home yet and wanted to squeeze in a game of pool or two before retiring for the evening. The vehicle pulled over at the intersection of Allen and Pacific, 200 feet from the tavern, but Kelly never arrived. She has never been seen again. While investigators believe her disappearance to be an isolated incident, the disappearance of a second mother less than two weeks later stirred up fears that a serial killer might be stalking the streets of southwestern Washington cities. One year later, the dismembered remains of a third missing woman were discovered in a vast wooded area not far from where all three were last seen. Did Kelly Wright fall victim to this same monster, or was she targeted by someone she knew, perhaps even someone she had once loved? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 205, The Disappearance of Kelly Wright Sims. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious disappearance of 27-year-old Kelly Wright Sims. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 27-year-old mother of three, Kelly Wright Sims, went out for a night of fun, friends, and drinks, but never made it home. For more than 30 years, the mystery of her disappearance has haunted those who knew and loved her, but the answers have always remained out of reach. This is episode 205, The Disappearance of Kelly Wright Sims. It was a cold fall night in the southwestern Washington city of Kelso. 27-year-old Kelly Sims had plans for the night. After arranging babysitters for the kids, she set off to participate in a darts tournament with her boyfriend at a local bar. At some point, words between Kelly and her partner turned heated, and when they left that night, he headed home while she made the short walk to a neighboring bar. There, she ran into a group of friends and decided to hang out for a while in an attempt to salvage her night out. The group would leave together, and Kelly would never be seen again. Reportedly, upon returning to the Kelso area, Kelly decided she wasn't ready to get home yet. According to the driver, she requested that he drop her off at the intersection of Allen Street and Pacific Avenue, as she planned on heading over to the Rendezvous Tavern to shoot some pool and cool off before returning home where there was a good chance she'd continue her argument from earlier in the evening. Unfortunately, she'd never make it to the rendezvous, and what exactly happened that night has haunted friends, family, and loved ones for more than three decades. Kelly Diane Wright was born on Sunday, February 24th, 1963, to Norma Wright in Tallahena, Oklahoma. Kelly is part Native American, And while some official documents note that no specific tribal information is known, other sources list her as being a member of the Choctaw Nation. According to friends of the family, Kelly never knew her biological father and was not raised by him. Reportedly, her father was in the military, and while she knew his name, at no point in her life did she track down or have any established relationship with him. In fact, the last name of Wright may not actually have been Kelly's birth surname, as it's been reported that she later took right from her stepfather. It is worth noting, though, that there is a genealogical record which may be attributable to Kelly. 
Tally Hina is located in Lafleur County, Oklahoma. However, it's right on the border with neighboring Lattimore County. Lattimore County records show that on Sunday, February 24th, 1963, a child was born and named Kelly Diane Oler. These records can additionally be tracked to a Norma Oler living in Oklahoma during this period of time. While I can't, with 100% accuracy, report that this is in fact the birth record of Kelly Wright, it does appear to link up in location, date, and her mother's name. Given that Norma never married Kelly's biological father, this may explain why he's been difficult to track, as his last name does not seem to appear on any official documents. Norma would go on to marry a man with the last name Wright, who would raise Kelly as his stepdaughter for a period of time. The small family would end up in California, where Kelly was still quite young, and over the course of the next few years, they'd live in the Golden State, bringing two more children into the world. While we can't know for certain how long Kelly and her mother lived in California, it doesn't appear to have been long before Norma and her new husband separated, and she migrated further north, taking Kelly into Oregon and finally the state of Washington. Ultimately, Norma would settle in Longview, a city in Cowlitz County situated along the Columbia River, which functions as a natural border with Oregon. While today, Longview is listed as the most populous city in Cowlitz County with more than 37,000 residents, back in the late 60s and early 70s when Kelly would have moved there, the population was somewhat smaller, with 1970s census data showing a record for 27,000 residents. While demographics for Longview show that 86% of the population identify as white, Native Americans represent just over 2%, and many have noted the extensive cultural and historical record of indigenous peoples in the area. Prior to the influx of Euro-Americans in the mid-1800s, Longview was known as the home to Mount Coffin, a promontory utilized for generations as a native burial ground. Brenda Rismone. Kelly's best friend, sat down for an interview with the podcast Unfound, hosted by Ed Denzel, and explained that she met Kelly when the two were very young. Their mothers were neighbors who had become friends, and so their daughters often played together. Brenda described Kelly as being like a sister to her, noting that they spent almost every free waking moment together for the vast majority of their childhoods. According to friends and family, Kelly was a fun-loving youngster who loved listening to music, telling jokes, and professional wrestling. Brenda told Unfound that she and Kelly often watched regional wrestling out of Portland, and when they got older, they'd make the trip south to see some events live and in person. In addition, Kelly was majorly into both darts and shooting pool. Kelly would go on to attend North Lake Elementary School in Longview along with Brenda. Between spending time together at home and at school, the bond of friendship forged was incredibly tight, and the two were nearly inseparable, even when they weren't together. Brenda explained that when they were apart, they'd talk on the phone often, and sometimes would call one another just to watch shows and movies together as they chatted. Kelly went on to attend Kelso High School and later Mark Morris High School. According to Brenda, while the two young women were into wrestling, other sports didn't grab their attention. They weren't overly involved in extracurricular activities and shared such a disinterest in sports that they didn't even attend football games at the local high school, instead opting to hang out with their friends or with each other. Kelly tended to play to the beat of her own drummer, never afraid to do what she wanted, even if it meant going against the crowd. She was an individual, unique, she didn't find it necessary to be a part of the greater collective if their flow was heading in a direction she didn't find appealing. In 1980, when Kelly was 17 years old, she became pregnant for the first time. Reportedly, Kelly and the baby's father planned to marry, but things changed when Kelly went into labor dangerously early. The child, a boy, was born extremely premature and sadly did not survive. Kelly was devastated by the loss, a pain which never left her, and throughout the rest of her life, she would often think about her lost son, and any time she became pregnant, she'd go through the stress and pain of worrying that she might lose another child. Kelly was set to graduate from Mark Morris High in 1981. Public records showed that on March 17th of that year, Kelly married her high school sweetheart, Scott Sims. At first, 
She moved in with Scott and his family, though that situation has been described as highly volatile. Reportedly, Scott's mother never liked Kelly, and the two would frequently argue with Scott being caught in the middle. Eventually, Kelly and Scott decided to head out on their own, moving down into California. In 1982, they welcomed their first and only child, a daughter named Cassandra. Unfortunately, by this point in time, the relationship was already on the rocks, and the couple, along with their daughter, moved back to Washington. According to Brenda, the relationship was in a bad state. The couple were constantly fighting, and while no one has ever made a direct accusation, some have suggested the arguments may have turned physical on several occasions. Apparently, a lot of their problems originated from the fact that Scott was frequently out of the house. Whether he was working or hanging out with friends, he seemed to view Kelly's position as a mother with a very old-school mentality. He was free to live his life, and she was supposed to be at home, taking care of the baby and keeping house. Kelly, it seems quite clear, did not agree with those outdated concepts. By the end of 1982, the writing was essentially on the wall, and in early 83, at the age of 20, Kelly called her dear friend Brenda and asked for her help. She was leaving Scott, moving out, and striking out on her own with her daughter. At that time, Kelly moved back in with her mother, Norma, who was still living around Longview. There are varying reports about Kelly's relationship with her mother, with some saying the two were very close, while others stated they argued frequently and had a lot of trouble getting along. Based upon the data available, it appears more likely that Kelly's relationship with her mother wasn't all that unlike most relationships. Sometimes they got along really well. Other times, they had shouting matches and disagreements about everything from Kelly's life choices to how she raised her daughter. Kelly and Scott filed for divorce, and the decree was finalized in November of 1983. The Longview Daily News reported that Scott would win primary custody of their daughter. According to Brenda, this result had a lot to do with Kelly's mother. Brenda told Unfound that one night Kelly had left her daughter with Norma and went out with some friends. When she returned home that night, an altercation occurred between Kelly and her mother, which resulted in the police being called. Officers advised Kelly to return in the morning and everything would be fine. However, when she came back the next day, she learned that Norma had handed her daughter over to Scott. And when they went to court for the divorce, Norma apparently testified on Scott's behalf. In the end, Scott allegedly signed over custody of Cassandra to his own parents, believing they were better suited to raise the child. As a result of the divorce decree and Scott's mother's apparent hatred for Kelly, over the course of the next seven years, she would only get to see her daughter a handful of times, leaving a gaping hole in her heart, one which would not be quick to heal. As for Kelly's relationship with her mother, the two somehow managed to work their way through this difficult situation and Kelly would live with her mother off and on over the next few years. Kelly would go on to meet a man named Thomas Lester Newton, though pretty much everyone refers to him by his middle name. How the two came together, no one's quite sure, though it's been suggested that they may have met at a pool hall. As Kelly grew older, her interest in pool and darts only grew stronger, so she loved shooting pool and hanging around bars and pool halls. Their relationship was good, at least in the beginning. Reportedly, the two got along well and would eventually move in together. Lester worked at a transmission shop and made good money. Kelly was taken care of, at least financially. Kelly and Lester would go on to have two children, a daughter born in 1985 named Brittany and later a son named Thomas. According to Brenda, she received a call from Kelly around the time of Thomas's birth, at which point she expressed her worry. Like the first child she'd lost, Thomas had been born premature and was being kept in the NICU. Thankfully, however, the child fought through the difficulty and grew into a healthy, happy baby boy. Kelly was through the roof, thrilled and excited to have two daughters and now a son. Whether it was the changes the arrival of children can bring to a relationship, other issues boiling over, or just a sign of things not being meant to continue, Kelly and Lester's relationship began a downward slide in the late 1980s. The two began arguing frequently, and while Brenda has said she never saw things escalate to physical violence, she was aware that on at least one occasion, Kelly had gotten mad enough that she'd taken a large portion of Lester's clothes out of his closet and burned them in the yard. According to Brenda, 
The two lived near one another at this time, and she saw Kelly often. Brenda described Lester as a drunk, saying that of all the times she'd encountered him, she almost couldn't remember a single one where he was sober. There had been some mild debate about the nature of the relationship between Kelly and Lester. Even when times were good, some have suggested that he may have been controlling and domineering. Brenda told Unfound that when Kelly told Lester she was going out, he often tried to tell her not to or he'd become angry. Only when Brenda was the person she went out with did it seem that Lester approved. It's quite easy to see how someone as independent and fiery as Kelly wasn't going to put up with a man telling her when she could go out, who she could go with, and where she could go. Suffice it to say, by the time Kelly turned 27 years old in February of 1990, things on the home front were extremely fractured. According to Brenda, Kelly loved to go out. Whether she was heading to the local bar for a few drinks, to the pool hall for a couple of games, or to a concert, she wasn't the type to spend a lot of time just loafing around the house. Brenda explained that Kelly often drank when she went out, but not to excess, and she didn't appear to have any issues with alcohol. In terms of drugs, Brenda said that she knew Kelly smoked marijuana from time to time, but was unaware of her using any other substances, noting that she dropped by the house frequently and never saw any indications of drugs or drug paraphernalia. Brenda went on to tell Unfound that the last time she actually saw Kelly in person was in mid-October approximately four days before she vanished. She dropped by Kelly's house just to check in and say hello, something the two did frequently. She described Kelly as seeming to be completely normal, not worried about anything in particular or seeming upset. Reportedly, she told Brenda that she and Lester had gotten into an argument when they were out days earlier, and Lester had kicked her out of the car, forcing her to walk for a period of time before he picked her back up. While this sounds like an intense situation, according to Brenda, Kelly treated it like it was just an argument that got out of hand and she wasn't all that bothered by it. When Brenda left that afternoon, Kelly told her to come back soon and Brenda said she would. Tragically, the two best friends who were closer than sisters would never see each other again. Kelly and Lester were living together in a home located at 807 South 5th Avenue in Kelso just a mile and a half across the Cowlitz River from downtown Longview. The couple planned to go out on the evening of Monday, October 15th, to a local bar where they'd take part in a dart tournament. In preparation for going out that night, Kelly arranged for her mother to look after their five-year-old daughter and hired a babysitter to look after their son, at the time, 14 months old. According to reports of the time, Kelly intended to go out with Lester, play in the tournament, hang out a bit, and then they'd pick up their son and head home. What exactly did happen that night, however, is the mystery still sitting at the core of this case. Kelly and Lester set out that evening for Tim's Timber Tavern, located at 213 Allen Street, approximately six-tenths of a mile north from the home they shared. According to patrons present at the tavern that night, the couple did arrive and participated in the dart tournament. However, Something went wrong between Kelly and Lester, and they started arguing. While no time frame has ever been established, witnesses stated that Kelly and Lester seemingly did not want to spend any time together that night. When they walked out the door, Lester went back to the car and, according to him, went home. Kelly decided that she wasn't interested in going home where, more than likely, she'd continue her argument with Lester. Instead, stepping out of the tavern, she turned to her right, heading 150 feet to the corner of Allen Street and North Pacific Avenue. She then turned north, walking up North Pacific, heading just over 100 feet before turning left, moving west to another bar, the Brass Rail, then located at 111 North Pacific Avenue. This was a bar Kelly had frequented often in the past, so many witnesses were able to report seeing her there that night as she was a familiar face in the crowd. According to several witnesses and Brenda, once she arrived at the Brass Rail, Kelly ran into a few friends, these being Keith Casey Brown and a woman named Bobby Joe. Apparently, there was a third person present, a man named Robert, who was friends with Brown. According to Brenda, Bobby Joe had known Kelly for years and considered her a good friend. How long Kelly and the group of three hung out at the bar that night has never been revealed, but we do know that Kelly would leave with them. 
Reportedly, Bobby Joe had experienced some car trouble that night, and Keith Brown was a tow truck driver. He decided to pick up his truck, at which time he, Bobby, Robert, and Kelly drove to the car's location. Brown hooked it up, and together the four rode along as they headed 10 miles north to Castle Rock, where Bobby Joe was living at the time. Reportedly, Bobby Joe invited the group inside to have a drink or some coffee, but they all turned down the offer, noting that it was getting pretty late and they needed to get home. At that point, Kelly made the trip back down south along with Brown and Robert. According to statements recorded at the time, Brown would later tell authorities that after leaving Castle Rock, he drove south towards Kelso, stopping at a house where Robert was planning to spend the night. Robert at that time was exceedingly intoxicated and couldn't remember much, if anything, about when he was dropped off that night. However, reports of the time seem to suggest that this occurred sometime between 1.45 and 2.45 a.m. on the morning of Tuesday, October 16th. After dropping off Robert, Brown stated that he was driving back towards downtown Kelso to bring Kelly home, but she had a change of plans in mind. According to Brown, since he had his tow truck, which he needed to drop off before getting his own car and then going home, Kelly didn't want to inconvenience him by making him drive out of his way. She requested that he drop her off at the corner of Allen Street and Pacific Avenue. This would have placed Kelly back in the area she had walked previously, leaving her 200 feet south of the brass rail, 200 feet west of Tim's Tavern, and 250 feet northwest of the Rendezvous Tavern. Reportedly, Kelly had told Brown that she was planning to drop by the rendezvous and shoot some pool before she went to pick up her son from the babysitter. According to Brenda, this wasn't out of the ordinary, and she believes Kelly would have been very comfortable being dropped off at that spot. She was super familiar with the area, and it wasn't far from her house. However, no one outside of Brown ever reported hearing Kelly mention that she planned to go to the rendezvous that night. What exactly happened to Kelly after she stepped out of the tow truck is unknown. She never made it to the rendezvous. She never arrived at or called the babysitter, and she never came home. While alcohol stopped being served at 2 a.m., the rendezvous was also a restaurant which stayed open 24 hours a day and had a pool table. So it's not out of the question for Kelly to have been heading there. Due to the circumstances of her disappearance, though, Keith Brown is noted as the last person to have seen her alive, although later investigation would question whether or not someone else was in the tow truck. Several hours after allegedly being dropped off, at approximately 7 a.m., the babysitter who had been taking care of 14-month-old Thomas arrived at Kelly and Lester's home. Lester answered the door, and she handed the baby over to him explaining that Kelly had never come to pick him up the night before and she had to get to work at her regular job. Reportedly, Lester took the child in and a short time later while making his way to work, stopped by and dropped the baby off for his mother to look after. After arriving at his job, Lester picked up the phone and called Norma, asking if Kelly had come there the night before. Norma, though, hadn't seen nor heard from her daughter since the previous day when she dropped off Brittany. Following this call, Norma quickly called Brenda to ask if she might know where Kelly was, but Brenda didn't have any idea either. According to her interview with Unfound, Brenda next called Lester at work in hopes of obtaining information about where Kelly was, but also to offer her help. She knew Lester's mother had some health issues that might limit her ability to properly care for the 14-month-old. Brenda stated that she offered to look after the boy for Lester until they could get the situation figured out, and he agreed telling her to pick Thomas up from his mother's house. Much to Brenda's surprise, upon arriving, she was given the child along with all of his clothes. This was a bit odd to her as she'd assumed she'd only need an outfit or two as Kelly would surely turn up. But the way she was giving everything made her feel like maybe something else was wrong. According to Brenda, after picking up the child, she spoke to Lester and he requested that she meet him at a local bar. When she arrived, Lester gave her an unspecified amount of cash and told her that if the child needed anything, to come back to him and he'd give her whatever money she needed. Again, Brenda found this very odd, but she was so caught up in taking care of the child and worrying about her friend that, in that moment, she didn't stop to question how fast everything seemed to be moving. It's only been in retrospect that she feels like maybe she missed some kind of a red flag, 
noting that Lester didn't seem even slightly concerned about where Kelly could possibly be or why she didn't come home. At the same time, some have suggested that given the arguments he and Kelly had the night before, he may have figured she was staying with someone else just to try and push his buttons. Brenda later stated that she reached out to Norma at this time and told her that she had the baby and was taking care of him. Norma was in favor of this decision as, at the time, she was already looking after Kelly's second daughter as well as a few children belonging to one of her sons. Given her age at the time and the amount of kids in the house, she thought Brenda taking care of Thomas would be the best option since she was already being pulled fairly thin with babysitting. When no one managed to track down Kelly, nor anyone who had seen her after she was dropped off that night, concern for the missing mother began growing. On Wednesday, October 17th, Norma contacted the Kelso Police Department and reported her 27-year-old daughter missing. The investigation would be handed to Detective Andy Hamilton, the first case he was ever assigned. Being that investigators had details regarding where Kelly had last been seen, where she was allegedly going, and where she had already been, they began by going to each of the establishments in hopes of finding someone who may have seen or interacted with Kelly after she was dropped off. Witnesses at Tim's Tavern confirmed seeing Kelly there that night, along with Lester. Witnesses at the Brass Rail confirmed that Kelly had arrived on foot by herself. Employees and patrons of the Rendezvous, however, reported that they had not seen Kelly in the bar or anywhere near it. According to Kelly's mother, it wasn't exactly shocking that no one knew where she was, but it was more so concerning that no one had heard from her since she vanished. Speaking to the Longview Daily News, Norma explained, quote, She's gone away for a couple of days before, but she always came home or let someone know where she is. I'm really worried now because no one has heard from her and we don't have any idea what happened. End quote. After following up with employees and patrons at the bars that night, detectives next focused in on speaking with everyone who did see Kelly, including Lester and the three with whom she rode in the tow truck. Investigators would quickly find themselves facing a problem. Most of the people out that night had been drinking, and their stories were difficult to pin down as they changed several times. Beginning with Lester, he reportedly told police two separate accounts of what happened that night. In the first account, he stated that after arguing with Kelly, they had left Tim's tavern at the same time, but had gone their separate ways. In another account, he said that Kelly was still in the tavern when he decided to leave, going home by himself and heading to bed. Given the late hour, it doesn't appear investigators were able to find anyone who actually saw Lester arriving home, but he was there when the babysitter came the next morning. According to Brenda, case files she is in possession of state that detectives did conduct a search of Kelly and Lester's home, which he allowed, but nothing of evidentiary value was located. Next up, authorities wanted to speak with Keith Brown, Bobby Joe, and Robert, all of whom were present when Kelly arrived at the Brass Rail and were in the tow truck for the drive up north to Castle Rock. Bobby Joe's story was the same as it had always been. She'd run into Kelly at the bar, Keith Brown had agreed to tow her car up to Castle Rock, and all four rode together. When she last saw Kelly, she was sitting comfortably in the vehicle as they headed back towards Kelso. When investigators spoke with Robert, he had two different accounts of what occurred that night. In one, he reported that Keith Brown had dropped him off before Kelly got out of the truck. In another, he said he thought he might have still been in the truck when Kelly was dropped off. The second account is interesting since initial reports stated that two men had dropped Kelly at the corner of Allen and Pacific. However, there wasn't much investigators could do with the information as Robert acknowledged being very drunk that night and stated he could not accurately remember if he was there when she was dropped off or not. Apparently, given statements from others at the bar, investigators believed Robert when he said he was too drunk to remember anything. Keith Brown, known as Casey, the tow truck driver, told investigators the same story he did originally. After dropping off Robert, he was planning to bring Kelly home, but she told him she was going to swing by the rendezvous and requested that he drop her off at the corner of Allen and Pacific. According to Brenda, she had known Brown for nearly as long as Kelly. They'd grown up together and had gone to school together. She had no reason to doubt his accounts of the events that night, though she also stated that since the case remains unsolved all this time later, 
she isn't sure she can fully trust anyone who was with Kelly that night. This left investigators in a tight spot. They had a location where Kelly had last been seen, but nothing after that. No one who knew the 27-year-old mother of three believed that she would have just gone off somewhere. She cared far too much for her kids to abandon them. So that left only a handful of possibilities. Could she have changed her mind and decided to walk to a different bar? Might she have decided to make the 10-minute walk home? Could she have been intoxicated and somehow fell into the Cowlitz River? Or did she run into some kind of trouble on the streets in the early morning hours? They didn't have much of anything to give them a direction to go, and so they appealed to the public. Having Kelly's description and the circumstances of her disappearance reported in local papers and on TV, they also reached out to the Longview Police, as well as the Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office to be on the lookout for Kelly. In the meantime, Brenda took it upon herself to try and get things moving. Gathering pictures of her missing friend, she created missing persons flyers and began putting them up everywhere Kelly had been that night, as well as other places around town she was known to frequent. Brenda also spoke with employees at Tim's, the Brass Rail, and the Rendezvous, as well as people she knew who had seen Kelly that night. Sadly, as days began passing, the lack of developments made many, including investigators, lean towards the likelihood that Kelly had been the victim of foul play. Norma explained, quote, Every day that passes without hearing from her gives me that much less hope that she's all right. End quote. According to Norma, she was concerned about the children living with Lester as he had a serious drinking problem and didn't appear to be equipped to care for them. She ended up filing for custody and would ultimately get it for Brittany and Thomas. 44 years old at the time, Norma told the Longview Daily News that she was doing the best she could to raise the children, but she hadn't been prepared to take on the financial burden of raising two children at that point in her life. She explained, quote, Goodness, we weren't prepared for a little one. With the expenses, the diapers and stuff, there just wasn't enough money to go around. End quote. At the time, Norma was living on public assistance and was also supporting her own 16-year-old daughter on top of Brittany and Thomas. According to Zola Blaylock, a family friend, Norma had appealed to social services for additional help, but they weren't able to provide any. Even though it was going to be a struggle, Norma noted that she was glad to be in a position to take care of the grandchildren, saying that without her daughter, quote, they may be all that I have left of her. You want to hang on to some hope, but it's slipping away, end quote. While investigators believed they were working on an isolated case, the mysterious disappearance of another local woman would begin to stir up fears that perhaps there was a serial killer or abductor targeting young women in the area. On Saturday, October 27th, just 11 days after Kelly vanished, 19-year-old Michelle Frances Lauren dropped her five-month-old daughter off with her mother in Kalama, 10 miles south of Kelso, and then headed up north to attend a party in the southern half. Much like Kelly's case, the last report of Michelle came from a friend who claimed to have dropped her off at the I-5 overpass on Elm Street in Kalama. This location was approximately 11 miles southeast of Allen and Pacific, where Kelly had been dropped. According to investigators, Michelle attended the South Kelso party with several people and then left at 2 a.m. with a male friend who would drive her home. This friend told police that he dropped Michelle off at her request, in his opinion, because her boyfriend might be the jealous type. The overpass on Elm was noted as being two blocks from Michelle's apartment and just one block from her mother's home where she'd left her daughter. According to Longview Police Chief Steve Hendricks, because of the similarities between the two cases, they were also coordinating with the Kelso Police and Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office. Andy Hamilton, the detective assigned to Kelly's case, spoke with the Longview Daily News about both women's disappearances. Hamilton noted that, yes, there were similarities, but there were also a lot of differences. Kelly and Michelle did not know one another, did not regularly attend the same establishments, and as of that time, no connection could be found between the two missing women. Hamilton explained, quote, We're just pooling our resources to make sure we cover all possibilities and to keep updated on the progress of both cases. End quote. Sadly, for both missing women, 
October would come to an end without any new information or possible leads. The same could be said of November and then December. By January of 1991, Kelly and Michelle had been missing for more than two months, and their families were struggling, both with the lack of developments and the emotional toll of not knowing where their loved ones were or even if they were alive. In mid-January, Bob Swanson, the chief criminal deputy for the Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office, noted that Michelle's family had raised money for a reward for information leading to her whereabouts or the arrest and conviction of the person who had been responsible for her disappearance. Swanson went on to say that, as of that time, they still had not established any links between the two women's disappearances, though he did report that they had received multiple calls from people who claimed to have seen Kelly across the Columbia River in Oregon. Unfortunately, when detectives followed up on these leads, witnesses could not say with any certainty that the woman they had seen was, in fact, Kelly Sims. For the most part, the year of 1991 passed by at a grueling pace for Kelly and Michelle's family. From the outside looking in, it seemed as though no one was really doing anything to try and track them down. Members of Michelle's family expressed their frustration, noting that they'd been spending their free time going through wooded areas surrounding the spot where she had allegedly been dropped off. As for Kelly, police stated they received multiple tips about her fate, but when run down, they always seemed to hit a dead end. By October, a year had already passed, and investigators were no closer to finding answers for Kelly and Michelle, and they were about to have a third young woman go missing. On Tuesday, October 15, 1991, the family of 29-year-old Kelly South reported her missing after she failed to return home from a night out that weekend. According to the official timeline, Kelly South was last seen alive at Hillman's Restaurant in Longview, approximately 1.4 miles southwest from Allen and Pacific and 9.8 miles northeast from the I-5 interchange at Elm Street in Kalama. On Thursday, October 17th, Kelly's identical twin sister, Kaylee, learned that Kelly had last been seen in the company of Keith Anthony Barton at the Hillman restaurant. In hopes of obtaining information, she contacted Barton, who told her that he'd offered Kelly a ride home that night, but she'd turned him down, and he last saw her walking down Commerce Avenue, where Hillman's is located. Later that afternoon, an off-duty Kelso police officer hunting in the vast Rose Valley stumbled upon dismembered human remains. While investigating at the scene, deputies from the Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office reported that they had discovered unspecific evidence linking Keith Barton to the crime scene. Ultimately, Barton was arrested after investigators found witnesses who could place Kelly South at Barton's apartment after she left the restaurant. Getting permission from the owner of the apartment complex, investigators searched the dumpster behind the building and found two bloody plastic bags, as well as Kelly South's shoes. A subsequent search of Barton's car revealed a receipt for the rental of a carpet cleaning machine in the days following South's disappearance. When detectives visited the shop from which the machine had been rented, they were able to examine it for evidence at which point human hairs matching South's were found. At that time, Barton was living in an apartment at 640 Olson Road in Longview, approximately two and a half miles north of the restaurant. Following his arrest, Barton requested the assistance of a public defender and was held on $100,000 bail after entering a plea of not guilty to second-degree murder charges. Now, here is where things take an interesting turn. Considering the similarity and proximity of both Kelly Sims and Michelle Lauren's disappearances with the abduction and murder of Kelly South, investigators began looking for connections between Barton and the two other missing women. Cowlitz County Sheriff Brian Peterson, asked about the possibility that Barton was involved, told the Longview Daily News, quote, I've got nothing that I know that links those three people together. Until this thing is all over, we just can't say, end quote. However, there were some details of the case that might have suggested a link. The Rose Valley area in which Kelly South's remains were found is within five miles from where Michelle Lauren was allegedly dropped off and within five miles of both Barton's mother's home as well as his half-brother, Marty Ogden. As fate would have it, on the night Michelle Lauren vanished, it was Marty Ogden who was driving her home 
and claimed to have dropped her at the intersection of Elm Street and I-5. In addition to this, Michelle was known to Marty's family and had spent a lot of time at their house, and according to Ogden himself, they'd even dated at one point in time. The night Michelle vanished, she was attending a party in South Kelso. As it turns out, it wasn't really a party, but more of a small gathering. Michelle had her daughter with her former boyfriend, a man named Howard Teal, who had begun dating Michelle when he was 21 and she was 14. I'm pretty sure when you're 21 years old and the girl you're dating is 14, that's not dating, that's pedophilia. Michelle would be 19 years old when she had a daughter with Teal, and ultimately they would go their separate ways. But considering their daughter, they maintained contact and somewhat of a friendship. On the night of Michelle's disappearance, Teal picked her up and drove back to his garage apartment in Kelso, where Marty Ogden was already waiting. According to Ogden, Teal asked him to drive Michelle home that night because he didn't have enough money for gas and they lived in the same general area. Questioned by investigators, Ogden stated that Michelle was pretty drunk that night and he doesn't know what could have happened to her, sticking to his story that he dropped her off at Elm Street. However, Ogden also stated that he thought Michelle asked him to drop her off there because she didn't want her boyfriend to be jealous. This seems like an odd statement as, at that time, Howard Teal was Michelle's ex and there's never been any information reported to indicate she had a new boyfriend at the time. Ogden also claimed that not only was Michelle still alive, he had seen her in the years since she disappeared. Ogden told the Longview Daily News that he spotted Michelle near a church in the city of Battleground, 25 miles south of Kalama. Ogden explained, quote, I ended up hollering at her and she ran off. I know for a fact it was her, end quote. Driving this point home further, Ogden claimed that he was on the lookout for Michelle if for no reason other than to clear his name. He told the news, quote, I'm going to drag her ass to the police station because it kind of pisses me off. I'm getting tired of being accused, end quote. In May of 1992, Keith Barton pleaded guilty to murdering and dismembering Kelly South. Asked why he had done so, Barton claimed to have been drunk and high on cocaine at the time and believed that Kelly was the devil. Ogden countered his half-brother's plea, arguing that he had only agreed to plead guilty because the media had already persecuted him and he couldn't possibly get a fair trial. Ogden accused local investigators of planting the evidence they'd collected in order to frame Barton since they hadn't been able to solve several missing persons cases in the area and the local community was calling for answers. Asked her thoughts on both Keith Barton and Marty Ogden, their mother, Marjorie Nimmo, told the papers they were both innocent, saying, quote, they're both victims of circumstance, end quote. While Barton was awaiting sentencing, local investigators called an assistance from the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit. They were hoping that FBI experts might be able to analyze Barton's crime in order to determine whether or not he might be connected to other unsolved homicides and disappearances, those of Kelly Sims and Michelle Lauren in particular. County Prosecutor C.C. Bridgewater described Barton as a truly frightening individual, saying that his crime had been absolutely heinous. Bridgewater described Barton in the courtroom as unmoved and seeming disinterested in the entire process unfolding before him. Asked about the possibility that Barton could be connected to the disappearances of Kelly or Michelle, Bridgewater replied, quote, It's so speculative. We don't have any hard evidence or anything, end quote. Tom Lauren, Michelle's brother, argued that it didn't matter if there was any hard evidence. Barton should be thoroughly investigated in other crimes, including his sisters, before he's ruled out. Tom explained, quote, definitely they should investigate. If a person can do something like that, there's no telling what he's done in the past or what he might do in the future, end quote. Marjorie Atia of Redmond, Michelle's half-sister, told the media that she was happy to hear the FBI had been called in, but she still felt that not enough was being done to properly investigate Michelle's case. Marjorie urged investigators to dig deeper into both Barton and Ogden as being connected to her sister's case. According to investigators, they had questioned Ogden several times about the case, but without evidence, 
There were no position to charge him with anything. Frustrated, Marjorie told the Longview Daily News, quote, I want as much help as possible so more people get involved. I want my sister found, end quote. Norma Wright acknowledged that she'd been keeping up with the Barton case, wondering if perhaps he could have been involved in her daughter's disappearance. Norma was frustrated, much like the Lauren family, feeling that not enough effort had been put into trying to find out what happened to Kelly. She explained, quote, There has been some things brought up that could connect him with the two. It's just all hearsay. At least the South family, they have the comfort because they know what has become of her. We're just left hanging. End quote. One month later, on Thursday, June 18th, Keith Anthony Barton was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Whether or not he was directly linked to Michelle Lauren, Kelly Sims, or anyone else has never been determined. Regardless of his guilty plea and the avalanche of evidence against him, Barton's family continued to argue in the public that he had been set up and framed for a crime which they did not believe he could have ever committed. Sadly, following Barton's conviction, Kelly and Michelle's names once again fell from the headlines, and their cases would grow quiet. Four months later, in early October, investigators stated that they had exhausted all of their leads. While the investigations were continuing, they hadn't gotten any significant leads since the beginning of the year. Detective Andy Hamilton explained, quote, We have been looking at any leads that have come in. There really haven't been any since the first of the year, end quote. Hamilton noted that they had followed up on a major tip in January. Hamilton, though, wouldn't go into any details about what the tip was, nor where it may have led. Longview Police Chief Steve Hendricks was more direct in expressing his frustration with the lack of information, saying, quote, We have absolutely nothing, not a thing. All the leads and all the information we had, the Sheriff's Office has, and it has been checked and rechecked again. We're still just waiting to hear something, end quote. According to Hendricks, they hadn't received a tip in Michelle's case since December of 1991. Norma Wright reached a point where she was hurt, frustrated, and felt somewhat abandoned by investigators. It seemed like whether there were updates or not, new tips or none, she had been left mostly in the dark. She explained, quote, the 16th will be two years. So this has been a hard month for us to go through. You really have your doubts as to whether they really are doing anything. If we hear something just one way or another from anybody, good or bad, it would be a relief. End quote. Evelyn Rhodes, Michelle Lauren's mother, expressed equal frustration and abandonment, noting that it seemed like investigators were moving on from the case and were never going to find any answers. Evelyn stated that the entire family believed Michelle had been killed noting that no one who knew her believed she would ever walk away from her beloved daughter. Asked about the possibility that Keith Barton could have been responsible, Evelyn replied that it was more likely his half-brother, Marty Ogden, was somehow involved. She explained, quote, If he didn't do it himself, he knows who did. End quote. For their part, investigators told reporters that no one had been ruled out, though they didn't have anyone they could call a suspect either. The problem being what it had been since the beginning. They simply couldn't find any evidence to link either Barton, Ogden, or anyone else to Michelle or Kelly's disappearances. Asked her thoughts about it, Norma explained that there could possibly be a connection, but she thought it was more likely that someone else was involved in her daughter's case. While she didn't give any names, she suggested that it may have been someone who knew Kelly and was close with her, saying, quote, if not directly, then they know what happened to her. She had to fight even to have Thomas. He was a preemie. She would never have left her kids. End quote. By this point in time, it was difficult for Norma to focus on the investigation, as all of her free time was taken up with her grandchildren. Brittany, then seven, was still asking where her mother was. According to Norma, without an official answer, all they could do was tell the kids that their mother was in heaven. Thomas, 14 months at the time of the disappearance, was now three, but he didn't have any memories of his mother. While this was tragically sad, Norma thought if perhaps it might be a blessing in disguise, saying, quote, he hasn't had to go through the hurt that Brittany has, 
end quote. October of 1995 marked five years since Kelly and Michelle had disappeared, and seemingly investigators were no closer to supplying any answers. Detective Andy Hamilton asked about the cases, shared his belief that considering the passage of time, the lack of sightings and contact, it was more than likely that both women were deceased. According to Hamilton, they hadn't received a tip in Kelly's case for over a year, but the investigation was continuing. They were checking in on any situations in which remains were found but not identified, hoping that finding a body could bring some closure, saying, quote, absent that, I guess it leaves everyone wondering, end quote. As for the Lauren case, Chief Criminal Deputy Bill Mahoney stated that while Ogden had been considered a person of interest in her disappearance, he couldn't comment on his potential involvement. Mahoney went on to say that the case remained open, but they hadn't received a viable tip in nearly four years. He explained, quote, We have been working on it continually, and we have followed through with every lead we've been given by the family and interested people in the community, end quote. Despite the guilty plea of Keith Barton and Kelly South's murder, and the fact that his half-brother Marty Ogden was the last person to see Michelle alive, their mother, Marjorie Nimmo, continued to issue her belief that both of her sons were innocent. Asked about rumors that Ogden had killed Michelle, Nimmo replied, quote, He isn't involved in any of it. He was a friend. She was like a daughter to us. He would protect her, not hurt her. We believe she is still alive somewhere but nobody will believe us. End quote. Six months later, on Saturday, April 20th, more than 70 members of law enforcement and search and rescue teams began executing a grid search, utilizing strings and five-foot intervals in a wooded area east of I-5 between Kalama and Woodland to the south. This search was urged on after a man collecting rocks in the area brought human bones into the sheriff's office. The search party entered the woods at 9.25 a.m. and were searching in a 100-yard radius from where the bones were originally discovered. Detective Sergeant Dwayne Angler of the Sheriff's Office, when asked about whether the remains might be those of Kelly Sims or Michelle Lauren, replied, quote, We're hopeful it's one of those two and not an unknown third. End quote. Two days later, on Monday, April 22nd, Coroner Gary Grieg announced at a press conference that dental records had positively identified the remains as being those of Michelle Lauren. Deputy Bill Mahoney stated at the press conference that the cause of death was being listed as homicide, though he did not go into details about what indicated this. He also noted that items of interest were found at the scene, though again, he would not expand upon the details. Evelyn Rhodes, Michelle's mother, acknowledged that the discovery had brought back all of the pain, but she was comforted seeing progress being made and now having a definitive answer. She explained, quote, We're just glad this part has been resolved. We know it's a murder now. She didn't just go out and lay down in the woods by herself. End quote. Asked about her belief that Ogden was involved, Evelyn doubled down by stating that her daughter was afraid of Ogden and would never have gotten into a car with him alone if she had any choice in the matter. Ogden, being the beacon of intelligence and heartfelt emotions that he is, responded to this accusation and the discovery of Michelle's remains by denying that she had anything to fear from him and sticking tightly to his guns that he saw her alive after she went missing, though he now tempered that statement by clarifying that the person he saw looked just like Michelle, but maybe he was wrong. Ogden told the Daily News, quote, It's a bunch of lies. We kind of dated and stuff like that. She was like a sister to me. I was going to ball her out when I found her. I wasted $200 in fuel just looking for her. End quote. Gee, I wonder why Michelle wasn't interested in him. Howard Teal, who fathered a daughter with Michelle, didn't say much publicly about the case, though when he was asked about Ogden saying he had dated Michelle, Teal took issue, clarifying to the Daily News, quote, he was a wannabe boyfriend. He sent Michelle notes asking her to go steady. He never had a date in his life, end quote. The Lauren family urged investigators to renew their investigation of Ogden, hoping that with the discovery of Michelle's partial remains, they might be able to corner him with new evidence. 
Ogden, though, made it clear though he wasn't about to allow himself to be the focus of the investigation, telling reporters that if detectives, quote, start bugging me, I'll have harassment charges brought against them, end quote. Marjorie Nimmo as well stuck to her beliefs, telling reporters, quote, I know my son and I know the situation. He would not have harmed her. I've got a son in prison, yes, but I'm not going to dwell on that either, end quote. I guess that makes sense. You've got a son in prison for murder and dismemberment and another son who was the last person to see Michelle Lauren alive. But why dwell on such things? You know, they're not her kids that were killed. So why should she care? What a family. Once again, both cases sunk back into silence. Michelle's family were finally able to hold a memorial for the loss of their beloved daughter, sister, mother, and friend. While there is some comfort in knowing the truth, it is nowhere near believing justice has been served. They wanted to see the person responsible charged and held accountable for the nightmare he had transformed their world into. Back at the home of Norma Wright, Kelly's family and friends were in the same position they had been since day one. No idea what happened to Kelly, who was responsible, where she was, or why she was taken from them. Unfortunately, no answers would be quick in coming. On November 30th, 2001, the Green River killer, Gary Ridgway, was arrested in Renton, Washington, more than 100 miles northeast of Kelso and Longview. While it was considered unlikely, investigators announced that they were working with the Green River Task Force in order to determine whether or not Ridgway was ever active in Cowlitz County, and if so, could he be connected to any of their unsolved disappearances and murders? Dave Bodine of the Sheriff's Office told the Daily News that they had worked with the task force in the past, but they had recently come back asking questions. Detective Andy Hamilton noted that they didn't believe there were going to be any links, stating that comparing the cases was more of a normal process when such a major arrest is made in the area. It does not appear that any connections between Ridgeway, Cowlitz County, or any of the unsolved crimes was ever established. Following this update, there was nothing new revealed about Kelly or Michelle's cases. 18 long years later, in January of 2019, Kelso Police Chief Andy Hamilton, the original detective on Kelly's case, sat down for an interview with Seattle Met. Asked about the case, Hamilton noted that it never made sense to him from the beginning. According to the investigation, Kelly was a good mother who was devoted to her children so the idea of her walking away was ruled out almost immediately. Hamilton went on to explain that he had traveled all over the state, following up tips and leads on Kelly's disappearance. While no additional details were ever given, Hamilton did note that he had traveled as far away as Yakima to track down people who seemed to have knowledge about Kelly's case. He also stated that, in the past, they had done searches with cadaver dogs but hadn't been able to find anything connected to Kelly. Asked about the status of the case and whether or not he blames himself for it remaining unsolved, considering it was his first missing persons case, Hamilton replied, quote, Do I beat myself up? I was new. Would you always play the ball game differently? Yeah, I think I'd have done things differently. I don't know if it would have changed the outcome. End quote. The last few pieces of information on this case came out of Kelly's best friend, Brenda Rizmoen, when she appeared on Unfound, hosted by Ed Denzel in October of 2019, nearly 29 years to the day that Kelly was last seen alive. According to Brenda, not only was there a possible link to Keith Barton, but there were also curious details regarding two men who had played very prominent roles in Kelly's life. Reportedly, when investigators went to the bars and taverns Kelly had been to that night, they weren't able to gain a lot of helpful information. However, they did find something out at the rendezvous, the one place Kelly never made it to. Brenda stated that the police file she is in possession of revealed that, on the night of Kelly's disappearance, her ex-husband Scott Sims was present at the rendezvous. Reportedly, two waitresses working that night told investigators that Sims was there and that at one point, he mentioned Kelly, accusing her of being abusive towards their daughter. When interviewed by police, however, 
Scott allegedly stated that he was not at the rendezvous that night because he was working. When work records showed that he was not at work that night, he supposedly changed his story, saying that he did go out to a bar, but it wasn't the rendezvous. However, when investigators checked on that statement, they discovered the bar had closed at 2 a.m., while witnesses at rendezvous placed Scott there closer to 3 a.m. Brenda said that in Scott's statement to police, while he denied being at the rendezvous, he did acknowledge an incident which had occurred when he ran into Kelly in June of 1990, four months before her disappearance. In the statement, Sims claimed that he had gone to the brass rail one night and Kelly was there. At some point in time, whether it was due to an argument or for other reasons, Sims claimed that Kelly had dumped a full beer over his head and he ended up being banned from the bar for the next three days. While this is a bizarre encounter to be sure and shows no easing up of tensions between the former couple, Brenda stated that Kelly had never expressed fear or concern about Sims and hadn't had any violent or frightening encounters with him since the divorce. Whether or not investigators continued down this path to dig deeper into Scott Sims' movements that night is unknown. According to Brenda, there was nothing in the files about any searches of Sims' property, vehicle, or polygraphs. In addition, Brenda reported that files indicated Sims has returned to the rendezvous at some point after Kelly's disappearance and mentioned that she still hadn't been found, and even though they had their rough times, he still cared about her and hoped she was all right. Next, Brenda turned her attention to Thomas Lester Newton. She stated that she hadn't seen him since Kelly's disappearance, but bumped into him in a parking lot in 2014. During their conversation, Brenda stated that Lester made a strange statement to her, noting that when Kelly disappeared, people had asked him why he'd hit her so hard. Unsure of what he was saying, Brenda asked him to clarify, and in her words, he confirmed the previous statement before suddenly freezing as though he realized he'd said something he should not have. I should note, as seems to always be the case with Lester, he was drunk during this encounter. Brenda hoped to get more information out of him, so she invited him over to her house. And while he said he would drop by, she never saw him again. In a final strange detail, Brenda stated that she had run into a mutual friend of hers and Kelly. Reportedly, this friend told Brenda that in the months leading up to Kelly's disappearance, she had had an encounter with Keith Barton. According to the friend, Barton had hit on Kelly, and she turned him down, causing Barton to reply that she needed a real man. The friend went on to say that Kelly shot Barton a dirty look and replied, you ain't no man. Unfortunately, when it comes to this statement, there's no real way of knowing the exact context nor exactly when it occurred. Whether or not Barton was involved in Kelly's case or Michelle's remains unknown. Kelly has never been located, nor have any remains been found for more than 30 years. When last seen, Kelly Diane Wright Sims was described as being a Native American female with brown hair and eyes, standing 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighing approximately 120 pounds. Kelly was wearing a white pullover sweater and jeans. Both of her ears are pierced. She was reportedly let out of a vehicle at the intersection of Allen Street and North Pacific Avenue, south of the Brass Rail, west of Tim's Tavern, and north of the Rendezvous. At the time of her disappearance, Kelly was 27 years old and a mother of three. She has been missing since the early morning hours of Tuesday, October 16, 1990. While investigators and her family believe she is likely dead, were she alive, she would have turned 59 years old this year. October 16th will mark 32 years since Kelly Sims was last seen alive. She's never been found. No trace of her has been discovered. And what exactly happened to her remains a mystery. There are many who believe they know what happened, with fingers pointing in different directions. This has left her loved ones in the horror of limbo, never knowing the truth, never seeing justice done, never being able to give her a proper burial. Asked about the loss of her best friend, Brenda Riz Moen replied, quote, It's been so many years that you wonder and you wonder. Did she suffer? 
I know she wouldn't walk away. She's got grandchildren she never got to meet. She missed weddings. She missed graduations. Her son took his first steps with me. His first word, mama, was with me. It was unfair and selfish of whoever denied her those firsts. The disappearance of Kelly Sims is a highly complicated case with a lot of different moving parts. From people who believe that Kelly may have been targeted by someone she knew, to those who think Keith Barton may have been involved, or perhaps another unknown person, it's difficult to get down to the bottom of everything that could have happened that night. When you really look at it from an outsider's perspective, you've got a woman, apparently left alone on a street corner, who vanishes into thin air without anyone seeing her on the street, walking, near another bar, or anywhere else. In covering Kelly's story, it becomes necessary to look at crimes in the area and with similar circumstances. So then you have the murders of Kelly South and Michelle Lauren. One question which has always made the investigation vastly more difficult has been whether or not any of these cases were connected. Now, we know what happened to Kelly South, and we know who was responsible. Keith Barton pleaded guilty, explained what he was done, and was sentenced to 50 years in prison for the heinous act he committed. Barton was captured primarily because witnesses had seen him with Kelly South the night she vanished, and several pieces of evidence were found at his apartment, in his car, and in the carpet cleaning machine he rented. The next most logical connection here goes towards Michelle Loran. Her partial remains were recovered six years after she went missing. While no one has managed to link Barton to this crime, they were able to connect his half-brother, Marty Ogden, though not in terms of what actually happened. We know, based upon Ogden's own statements, that he was the one who dropped Michelle off that night. This leaves us in a position where the only account of what happened to her that night comes from the man her family believes was involved in her disappearance, who happens to be the half-brother of Keith Barton. For some, it is merely coincidence, while for others, nothing is ever that coincidental. When it comes to Kelly Sims' case, not nearly as much information is available, and therefore a potential list of suspects is also slim. I think the best way to examine the theories revolving around this case is to just take them one at a time and see what makes sense and what doesn't. Our cast of potential persons of interest involves her ex-husband, Scott Sims, the father of her two children, Thomas Lester Newton, the man who claimed to have dropped her off that night, Keith Casey Brown, and convicted killer Keith Barton. Outside of this group, there is, of course, a possibility that whoever was involved in Kelly's disappearance has never been publicly named or perhaps is even known. So, let's begin with Scott Sims, Kelly's ex-husband and the father of her oldest daughter. Kelly and Sims were apparently high school sweethearts. Multiple yearbooks digitized online show the years Kelly attended Kelso High School and Sims appears in those pages. According to the public record, Kelly and Scott were married in March of 81. The couple lived first with Scott's parents, though later left the home in part due to issues between Kelly and Scott's mother. They moved out of Washington, down to California, and then returned after the birth of their daughter, moving back into South Washington before filing for divorce. We know that Scott ended up winning full custody of their daughter through the divorce, and according to Brenda Rismone, this was due in part to Kelly's mother testifying on behalf of Scott. Without additional information, it's hard to know what exactly went on there, but Kelly and her mother somehow found a way to work through it and maintain a relationship. The divorce was finalized in November of 83, just shy of seven years before Kelly would mysteriously disappear. Over the course of those seven years, no one ever reported any issues between Kelly and Scott, nor did anyone seem to know about any encounters they may have had, outside of one where Scott claimed that Kelly had poured a beer over his head in the months leading up to her disappearance. Since we don't know a lot about Scott, what he was up to during those seven years and what has become of him in the 32 years since Kelly vanished, we can't really discuss his state of mind, behaviors, and potential motives for wanting Kelly gone, if indeed he did. For the most part, Scott doesn't come up in this case. When you research it, read the articles, read official reports, there doesn't appear to have been much of a connection thought to exist between them following their divorce. However, if the reports that Brenda quoted from in her guest spot on Unfound are accurate, that paints a very different story of what could have happened that night. Essentially, 
These reports indicated that on the night of the disappearance, Scott was not only in town, but was actually present at the Rendezvous Tavern where Kelly was allegedly heading. Now, this wouldn't mean much, generally speaking, but he becomes curious when the reports indicate attempts at deception from Scott. Reportedly, two waitresses at the rendezvous told investigators that Scott had been there that night, and not only was he there, he was talking about Kelly. One of the waitresses had gone to Kelso High School, and so Scott and her began talking about people they knew, at which point Kelly's name came up. According to the waitress, Scott seemed angry at the mention of her name and reportedly talked negative about her claiming that she had been abusive towards their daughter, something that no one in Kelly's life believes. Allegedly, when first asked about being there that night, Scott lied and said he was working. When that was proven false, he corrected his story and said he was out that night, but not at the rendezvous. Of course, when they checked where he said he was, that bar had already closed down by the time waitresses reported seeing him. So, of course, you have to ask, if the police are investigating the disappearance of your ex-wife, the mother of your daughter, Why would you feel compelled to lie about where you were? It's not a good look, and frankly, if the files Brenda possesses are legit, I can't for the life of me understand why this guy didn't become a major focus for the investigation. I suppose the problem is, there's no evidence to really link him to any crime. If he did lie about where he was that night, you have to wonder what he's trying to hide, but there's nothing more beyond that. There are no reports of anyone seeing Scott near Kelly, There's no one who has come forward over these past 32 years to give additional information that could potentially link him to her disappearance either. Sure, it may seem odd that seven years later, this guy is still complaining about his ex-wife, but some people really hold on to those bad feelings and never let them go. We all know that couple that split up, and while one of them has completely moved on with their life, the other one can still become quickly upset at just the mention of a name. I don't think by any means you can officially rule anyone out in this case, and I don't think Scott is any different. The problem is, it's hard to rule him in either. In my book, if you're lying to investigators about your whereabouts the night your ex-wife vanished, that warrants further investigation. The issue is, that doesn't appear to have happened here. Either detectives had reason to believe Scott was not involved, or they tried to dig deeper but never found anything, or... The family has been accurate in their belief that no one really tried hard to solve this case at all. Over the years, it's been frequently noted that Kelly was Native American, and as a missing indigenous person, perhaps detectives didn't care all that much. Given the nature of the investigation, I can't say I totally disagree, but I think the answer is more broad here. Look at Michelle Lauren's case, for instance. Was it a lack of care there as well, or was it just a matter of limited information, limited detectives, a lack of experience, and the inability to spend the money and man hours necessary to find out everything they possibly could? Without being inside of the investigation, it's very difficult to know what was going on here, but I really don't blame anyone for feeling like these investigations were very half-assed. So, for many... Scott Sims remains someone who should be looked at more closely in terms of his connection to Kelly and his whereabouts and movement in the hours both before and after she disappeared. However, Sims is not the only man in Kelly's life who many believe could possibly have been involved. So let's turn our attention now towards the guy who was then the current man in her life, Thomas Lester Newton. Lester and Kelly met sometime after the divorce, and over the next few years they went on to have two children together, a boy and a girl. People who knew Kelly and Lester reported that, in the beginning, their relationship was fairly positive, but over time it turned darker and darker. Some have accused Lester of being controlling of Kelly. Others have said he was the opposite, not paying a whole lot of attention to what she was doing or who she was spending her time with. The one angle almost everyone agrees on is that Lester was almost constantly drunk or drinking. There have been different accusations over the years that Lester may have been physically abusive towards Kelly, or perhaps that their arguments often turned physical, and neither was completely averse to lashing out physically. I'm not much of a fan of rampant speculation, so from my perspective, I tend to go with what Brenda reported. Brenda stated that while Lester and Kelly likely weren't a great match for each other, she never saw anything to suggest any kind of physical abuse was taking place, and Kelly never told her about abuse, nor claimed to have been frightened or concerned about Lester, nor was there any time where Brenda saw Kelly marked up as though she had been struck. Looking at the night of her disappearance, we know that Kelly and Lester left their home together, traveled up to Tim's Tavern, and participated in a dart tournament. At some point, 
an argument breaks out and the two go their separate ways. Now, in one instance, Lester allegedly tells police that he and Kelly left at the same time. In another statement, he supposedly says when he left, she was still in the bar. Lester stated that he drove home at that point and went to bed. Being that it was late, police didn't find anyone who could confirm what time Lester had gotten home, but we know he was there the next morning when the babysitter arrived. If indeed she got there at 7 a.m., that left a window of four to five hours between when he was with Kelly and when he was seen at the house. After leaving Lester, Kelly goes to the brass rail, meets up with some friends, and eventually takes a ride up to Castle Rock, before Keith Brown claims to have dropped her at the intersection of Allen and Pacific. In order for Lester to have been involved in Kelly's disappearance, one of two things had to have occurred. Either he was out looking for her and came across her walking on the street, or she decided to walk home instead of to the rendezvous. Perhaps she never planned to go there and just wanted to get out of the car. Or maybe she originally thought about it, but saw Scott, her ex-husband, through the window and thought better of having another argument that night. I suppose there's also the possibility that Lester could have gone back to the area to find Kelly, saw her getting out of a vehicle being driven by another man, and got angry. We really have no way of knowing. Investigators never seem to come up with much in terms of Lester potentially being involved. All we really have to go on is the story Brenda relayed, that when she ran into Lester 24 years later in 2014, he made a comment that people had asked him why he'd hit Kelly so hard that night. There's a few problems with this statement. Firstly, as seems to always be the case with Lester, he was drunk at the time, so whether or not he even knew what the hell he was saying is questionable. Beyond that, if indeed people had asked him something about hitting Kelly the night she vanished, where the hell are these people now? If any of them have come forward and told police he'd made such comments, or even worse, that they had witnessed some kind of an assault, it's never been reported by investigators or even commented on. I understand the compulsion many people feel to believe that when a woman goes missing, her partner or ex-partner is going to be responsible. Statistics tend to support this belief, but as is the case with statistics, they're not always a guarantee. Certainly, Lester could have been involved, just as certainly as Scott could have been. But again, you run into the same problem. There's no solid evidence linking either man to Kelly after she was dropped off that night. From what we know of Lester in the years since, he's never been connected to any other disappearances or violent crimes. It's also been presented as evidence of his potential guilt that Lester was so quick to hand over his children to Brenda and Kelly's mother. While I agree this is a bizarre way to behave in the aftermath of Kelly's disappearance, let's face it, this guy doesn't sound like the type who you'd want to be raising children anyway. He drinks all the time, he was evicted from the house he shared with Kelly a little over a month after she vanished, and at least at that time, in that place, he didn't want to be involved in raising kids, or he knew he was in no shape to provide them with what they would need from a father, especially now with their mother gone. I think part of the problem with this case is, almost any direction you look, Kelly was surrounded by a lot of people who were either drunk, disinterested, or completely unconcerned about her. The only people who have seemingly ever expressed any worry about her have been her best friend, Brenda, and her mother, Norma. Even other people who have been labeled as Kelly's close friends have never spoken up about this case, whether it be publicly or to law enforcement. Once you move past Scott and Lester, you're left with Keith Brown, the man who claimed to have dropped her off that night at the intersection of Allen and Pacific. We don't know much about Brown, but according to Brenda, he was a good, decent guy who both she and Kelly had known since they were young. They went to school together, their circles of friends intersected, and Kelly felt comfortable enough with him to go along for the ride up north and back. Honestly, that part of this case has never made any sense to me. You're at the brass rail, but you decide to leave and go along with friends as they tow a car to another town, and then you ask to be dropped off right back at the same spot where you were? Stranger things have surely happened, but I can't help but wonder if there were other reasons Kelly decided to go along on that trip. So, according to Brown, he drops Kelly off at her request. She apparently tells him she wants to go to the rendezvous, although no one else that night remembers her ever mentioning it. Sure, she could have just decided spur of the moment that she wanted to go there, or maybe she was giving an excuse just to get out of the car. There's really no way of knowing, and in all the years that have passed, no one has ever connected Brown to any violent crimes, 
nor suggested that he possessed any additional knowledge about what happened to Kelly. I did find it strange, however, that Brenda stated on Unfound that in all of the years that has passed, she has never asked Keith Brown about that night. I know I'd be eager to ask every question I felt he could possibly answer, but I could also understand being afraid of how he might react if he was involved in some way. He may have already made one person disappear. Why not you? It would probably be a big help if Robert, the other man there that night, could remember anything. But considering how drunk he was, I guess that is forever a lost cause. After Brown, there's the other Keith, Keith Barton. In October of 1991, he was at the Hillman's restaurant where he met and spent time with Kelly South. After leaving the restaurant, he takes her back to his apartment, where ultimately he murders and dismembers her. For his part, Barton tells authorities that he was drunk and using cocaine and thought Kelly was the devil, so he killed her. I don't know that I fully believe that reason. Seems more likely to me that she may have spurned his advances and he lashed out violently. So, we know Barton is a cold-blooded killer who lived in the area and frequented many of the spots that Kelly did. Depending upon how reliable you consider third-party information, there is a chance that Kelly encountered Barton in the months prior to her disappearance and insulted him when he hit on her. Many believe that Barton remembered Kelly and, at some point that night, may have seen her out on the street, walking towards the rendezvous, at which time he abducted her, killed her, and disposed of her remains in the wilderness surrounding Kelso, or perhaps down in the Rose Valley. That's entirely possible. And given Barton's history, it's not out of the question. I think the problem with Barton is, this guy's no genius. He leaves bloody bags and Kelly South's shoes in the dumpster behind his apartment building. He rents a carpet cleaner and leaves hair and blood evidence inside the machine when he's done. He dumps South's body not far from where his family lives. And his only cover story for the entire night is that he offered South a ride home and she declined despite multiple people in his apartment complex having seen him with Kelly after they left the restaurant. It seems likely that, were Barton involved, he probably would have left some kind of evidence behind. Then again, perhaps his sloppiness can be attributed to the fact that he was drunk and abusing cocaine that night. Had he a clearer state of mind when he came across Kelly Sims, he may have abducted and killed her in a way in which he knew he wouldn't leave any evidence behind. Sadly, though, like so much of this case, we have no way of knowing and nothing solid can connect Barton to the disappearance. Frankly, if Barton were found to be connected to any other crimes, it seems much more likely you'd find something to link him to Michelle Lauren rather than Kelly Sims, but I digress. Outside of the aforementioned people, theories get rather unspecific. There were rumors for some time after Kelly's disappearance that the crime may have been drug-related. Unnamed sources who obviously can't be verified alleged that Kelly had stolen or at least had been accused of stealing drugs from a dealer who responded by murdering her. We know that Kelly smoked marijuana, but there's never been reports of her doing anything harder. Her mother didn't believe she used any other drugs, and Brenda stated she never saw anything to make her believe Kelly had gone any further than smoking a joint here and there. I'm not going to say this rumor is out of the question, but at this point all I can really say is, it's a rumor. Investigators have never commented about it, so whether it's a legit tip or just the kind of rumors that can pop up in the aftermath of a crime like this, we don't know. Beyond that, it's what you would normally imagine. Could Kelly have accidentally fallen into the Cowlitz River that night, perhaps due to being drunk? Sure, but nothing's ever been found to support that. Could she have been a victim of a random crime? Maybe someone leaving one of the local bars sees her on the street and grabs her, or maybe someone she knew to some degree offers her a ride, and she gets in not realizing the dark intentions the driver has. Again, can't rule it out. However, the more you look around, the deeper you dig, the more you question, what you find in the end is that this is a case where a whole myriad of possibilities exist, and no solid evidence can be found to support one theory above the others. Given everything we know, what do you think is the most likely answer to this horrifying mystery? 32 long years have passed since Kelly Diane Wright Sims mysteriously vanished from the streets of Kelso, Washington. Over the past three decades, the mystery has only deepened as the vast majority of questions have gone unanswered, and those who have been accused of being involved 
have never done anything or provided any information that could secure their connection to the crime. After so much time, it's difficult to believe that this case will ever be solved. But every day we're seeing cold cases decades beyond when anyone believed they could be solved being answered. Unfortunately, when it comes to Kelly Sims, without additional information, the discovery of her remains or people coming forward with what they know, and they're definitely out there, her case will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Kelly Diane Wright Sims, there are some news articles available out there and a few forum posts discussing her case, but information is honestly fairly thin. For this episode, the Longview Daily News was the most helpful, as was the Unfound episode hosted by Ed Denzel, in which Brenda Rizmoen was interviewed. I will provide a link to that episode in the show notes should you want to listen. It's definitely worth your time. If you have any information about the disappearance of Kelly Diane Wright Sims, please contact the Kelso Police Department at 360-423-1270. Her case number is 90-16710. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod. Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very amazing Patreon producers. Thank you to Alicia Townsend, Amy Guthrie, Andrew Guarino, Ann Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Butram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloan Meyer, Fabulous TT, Greg, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fengel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Lyons, Susie the Cutie, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, Tom Archer, and Tom Radford. Thank you so much for your amazing support. Without you, this show would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. That wraps up this week's coverage of the mysterious 1990 disappearance of Kelly Wright Sims truly one of the most frustrating, complicated cases I've ever covered. I want to thank you all again for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.